Tonight, one of the leading voices was Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren. She joins us now. Senator Warren, um, how did you think you did tonight? Look, it was a chance to be able to talk with millions of people across this country about a, 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 a government that now works for the wealthy and the well-connected for a thin slice at the top, and how in 2020 we have a real chance to change that. You know, that we can attack the corruption head on, that we can restructure basic parts of this economy, and we didn't get to talk about it, we can protect our democracy so that everybody in America really has a chance to vote and to get that vote. There was obviously uh, sort of an ideological battle going on. Uh, you and, and Senator uh, Sanders, uh, some more, I guess, uh, they would be considered uh, more moderate members uh, of the party, and it was a real difference of, it's a larger clash or difference of ideas and strategies that's going on in the Democratic Party. I want to play an exchange you had uh, with, with, I believe it was uh, 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 Governor Bullock, uh, or no, it was with uh, Delaney. Uh, let's play that. I don't understand why anybody goes to all the trouble of running for president of the United States just to talk about what we really can't do and shouldn't fight for. <laughs> in Washington is corruption. It is giant corporations that have taken our government and that are holding it by the throat. The quote of, well, for many, the quote of the night, I don't understand why anybody goes to all the trouble of running uh, to the President of the United States to talk about what we really can't do and shouldn't fight for. Yeah. Ouch. Well, I think that's fair and right. You know, look, before I ever got in the race for president. I knew exactly what I thought was wrong in this country and why I was running for president and what it is I would get out there and fight for and the kind of fight that I would run. For me, this was about a grassroots movement from the beginning, not sucking up to a bunch of corporate CEOs and bazillionaires. And that's what I want to talk about every chance I get. We can't be the party of little changes from where it is right now. This is a time in America where people feel it and they feel it bad. That what's happening in this country is they get it. They haven't had a raise, most of them, for a generation, but the cost of housing is up, the cost of health care is up, the cost of child care. People watch their kids trying to get an education and just loaded down with tens of thousands of dollars in student loan but, debt. But you know the argument that Representative Delaney and others are making, which is, look, just politically, you're going to tell, you know, it was hard enough for Democrats to get the Affordable Care Act passed. You're going to be telling Democrat and the American people, more than 100 million of them, that their private insurance is going to be taken away. Look, I so admire what President Obama did. It was so hard to get us from a place where we were on health care to getting coverage for tens of millions of Americans. But notice how the world changed over time. I was in the Senate when the House voted to repeal health care coverage for tens of millions of Americans and then gave each other high fives. What kind of human beings high five over taking away health care coverage from tens of millions of people? But it came to the Senate of the United States. And there were enough people across this country who had come off the sidelines, who had spoken up, who had come to Washington, who would camped out in congressional offices and Senate offices all around the country, that we picked up Republicans and we saved health care for tens of millions of Americans. The moment is shifting in America. This is a point in American history. And we're we see the crisis and we're not going to win this moment with small ideas and spinelessness. The way we win this moment is with big structural change that touches people's lives. But to, to somebody out there who likes their health insurance that they have through their union or wherever it is, what do you say to them about what lies ahead, about why they should give up their private insurance? You know, I really wish we'd stop using Republican talking points on what people are giving up. This is about a transition and how people get their health care covered. And I say to them, go visit with Addie Barkin. He's the guy I talked about on stage, 35 years old. He's got the cutest little boy, Carl, and he has ALS and he's dying. He has great health insurance. And yet every month 
he's about $9,000 of medical bills that the insurance company just says, no, nah, we're not gonna pay for him. His wife, Rachel, spends hours and hours and hours on the phone begging the insurance company for coverage. He goes online like thousands of Americans who have health insurance to beg their friends, their family, and strangers, please chip in some money so I can pay for health care that my insurance company won't cover. But it sounds like you're saying to, to this person out there who likes their health insurance now, well, you don't really, you just don't understand that it's actually not that this good, that, about, that when push comes to shove, no, no, it's not no. going to be there for it's them. It's about, there's going to be a transition to something that's better. President Obama got us partway there. And God, it made a huge difference. People are alive today because we fought that fight. And notice how many people who stood on the sidelines even while he was the one who had to carry that all the way, who then got in the fight when they started talking about taking it away. And you can convince people that it's gonna be better than the plan they currently have? Well, it is going to be better. And here's the deal. The bazillionaires, the big corporations, they're gonna pay more. But hardworking middle class Americans, they're gonna have less money out of pocket in this. This is about how it is that right now this government continues to protect the giant insurance companies, continues to protect the giant drug companies. This is the moment to fight back. Some folks on the stage uh, tonight were talking about uh, raising, ta raising capital gains tax. Is that something you sure. are behind as well? Sure. <laughs> because there's a lot of folks at the very high level who are, uh, if, you're tax if you're focusing on salaries, what they're saying is, you're really missing what the real inequity no, is, which is you capital gains. understand. We should do a much better job on taxes on income. We should close up loopholes. There's a lot of what we do that makes no sense at all. But let's pay attention to wealth. Wealth inequality is where it has just totally jumped the rails. Think about it this way. You know, this is kind of what the income distribution looks like. Do you know what the wealth distribution, that means kind of like from people who don't have anything to people who have the most, it does this and then it goes through the ceiling and up into the stratosphere. A two cent tax on the top one tenth of one percent in America. That's about 75,000 fortunes. So we say your first 50 million, you get to keep free and clear. Your 50 millionth and first dollar, pitch in two cents and two cents on every dollar after that. Do you know how much money that produces? Enough for universal child care for every baby age zero to five. Enough for universal pre-K for every three-year-old and four-year-old. Enough to raise the wages of every child care worker and preschool teacher. Enough to provide universal technical school apprenticeship programs, community college and four-year college for every kid. Enough to raise the Pell Grant so it's a meaningful access to college enough to put $50 billion into historically black colleges and universities, enough to cancel student loan debt for 95% of the kids who've got it, enough to make a meaningful difference and start to close the black-white wealth gap in America and still have hundreds of billions of dollars left over. Money we can use, for example, to attack the opioid crisis. Money we can use to address the black-white entrepreneurship gap. This produces money because America's economy is so broken right now. We have let these giant fortunes accumulate and they're getting bigger every year. Two cents, two cents. It's not punitive. These guys at the top, last year, the 99% paid about 7.2% of their total wealth and taxes. That's most of the people watching this show. The 1%, they 3.2%. So asking them to pitch in two cents, man, it's still not a level playing field. And here's the deal. This is something that's popular, not just with Democrats, not just with progressives. This is something that independents like and a majority of Republicans support. It is a big idea that we can all get behind and will make a meaningful difference in people's lives.